morning and a very warm welcome to the sixth meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2021. Can I request that everyone turn their mobile phones and other devices to silent during the duration of the meeting? Our first agenda item is for the committee to consider whether the following instrument has been laid under the appropriate procedure. The Education, Fees and Student Support EU Exit Scotland Amendment Regulations 2021, SSI 2021-28. As this instrument relates to EU exit legislation, we are asked to agree that the SSI has been laid under the correct procedure before considering the SSI itself later today. The Government has allocated the negative procedure to the SSI and the DPLR committee reported that it considers this to be an appropriate procedure. Further details appear in papers one and two in the members' packs. Do members have any comments and are we agreed that the instrument has been laid under the appropriate procedure? I believe we are agreed. Thank you very much. Our second agenda item is the consideration of the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014 Modification Order 2021 Draft S5M 23949. It is a draft subordinate legislation that is subjective to an affirmative procedure. Details of the instrument appear in paper 3. An affirmative instrument has two agenda items. Firstly, the committee will have an opportunity to ask questions of the minister. And after that, we will return to agenda item three, which will be a debate on the motion. So, can I welcome to the committee this morning Marie Todd, Minister for Children and Young People, Simon Mayer, Head of 1140 Strategy and Delivery at the Scottish Government, and Carolyn O'Malley, Principal Legal Officer, the Scottish Government Legal Directorate. And can I invite the Minister Marie Todd to make an opening statement to explain the order? Thank you, convener. Um, when I attended this committee on the 9th of December, I reported that the ELC Programme Joint Delivery Board had recommended a new 1140 hours delivery date of August 2021. Following careful consideration and agreement to this recommendation by Scottish Ministers and Convention of Scottish Local Authority Leaders, I confirmed this date to Parliament on the 14th of December. We took another important step towards the delivery of the transformational ELC expansion programme on 22 January, when I was pleased to lay the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014 Modification Order 2021 in Parliament. This instrument will reinstate the duty on education authorities to make 1140 hours of funded ELC available to eligible children in each year for which they are eligible with a pro rata amount for each part of a year from August 2021. I would like to reassure the Committee that the Scottish Government continues to work closely with the local government to assess the impact of this current lockdown on delivery of 1140 hours and work together to address any emerging risks of the programme. In spite of the difficulties of the pandemic, including the current restrictions on ELC provision, local authorities and early learning and childcare providers have continued to work extremely hard to progress the expansion. The Scottish Government is also continuing to support local authorities to deliver the new entitlement in advance of the new statutory date where it is possible to do so. We have agreed with councils a shared commitment that where they can deliver expanded hours ahead of August 21, this will be offered to families. I am pleased to report that since I attended the committee on the 9th of December, the number of local authorities delivering the expanded 1140 hours in full has increased from 14 to 15, and many more local authorities are providing partial 1140 where they can. By reinstating the duty on education authorities to 1140 hours, this instrument is crucial to the expansion of funded ELC. We know that the ELC expansion programme can provide transformational benefits for children and families, and we remain absolutely committed to deliver. I am happy to respond to any specific questions the committee has. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Minister. Um, can I invite any members who wish to ask questions to the Minister to please put an R in the chat? Uh, Mr Johnson. I'll unmute myself. Thank you, uh, Convener. Um, and I, I thank the Minister for, for that update. I think we all welcome the, the reintroduction of the, the 1140 hour target. I think that uh, having adequate childcare in place is now clearly important, perhaps more so than before uh, the lockdown. But before uh, COVID-19, a key concern, as highlighted by Audit Scotland, was actually the availability of the buildings uh, required in order to deliver the 1140 hours. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, there was a very significant proportion of those buildings that were required to be completed through last summer in order to be ready for the autumn. So can the Minister update us on, on the preparedness and readiness of the buildings and, and capital requirements in order to uh, meet the 1140 requirement? Thanks. Thank you um, to the member. This is a, an excellent question and I'm very pleased to be able to answer it. Um, data available in January 2020, so January last year, showed that the ELC infrastructure programme was on track to deliver um, around 90 per cent of the forecast number of additional spaces required in August 2020. And that combined with contingency plans having been identified for 100 per cent of the critical capital pro projects um, provided confidence to us at this time last year that um, sufficient spaces would be available for the beginning of the ac academic year. Of course, the the um, pandemic has had an impact, and largely that impact has been felt on construction and has been felt on uh, recruitment. Recruitment is very much on track, but construction um, is not back to full pre-pandemic um, capacity. Nonetheless, despite that, we are absolutely confident that the construction that we require for this project um, will be completed in time for um, the reinstatement. We have worked very closely with COSLA and ADIS. We have looked extremely, uh, in an extremely detailed way and interrogated the evidence that we have um, to assure ourselves that um, local authorities are ready. The process included data and intelligence gathering right across local authorities, and all the components um, of delivery were assessed. And we also, you, you remember, I spoke about this at committee in December. We requested an independent health check review um, to be carried out on the programme, and the findings of that review supported um, the readiness of assessment. Now, we don't underestimate the challenges that are ahead of us particularly given the second wave of pandemic that we have faced, but we are absolutely confident that we can deliver this programme in August this year. Mr Johnson, are you content for me to move to the next member? Please do. Mr Green. Thank you, Convener, and uh, good morning, uh, the Minister. Uh, just uh, some questions on uh, the rollout of the policy. Can I ask uh, what consideration has been given uh, whilst the numerical increase uh, in August 21 is welcome on the principle of funding following the child. Uh, one of the primary concerns uh, that we have heard uh, is the uh, limited availability of hours being on offer to parents, um, primarily as a result of the additional hours only being available in the public uh, provided nurseries who have limited hours of days on offer or indeed limited days of weeks available and certainly not during school holidays as well. Um, can I ask what consultation has, has been uh, had uh, around that principle and whether the policy will help prove that situation? Thanks. So, um, thank you um, to the member for that question. You will understand that funding follows the child is a key cornerstone of this expansion. Um, and is underpinned by the national standard, which all providers um, have to meet in order to um, be signed up as funded partners. Um, thus far, um, local authorities have actually used more capacity from PV P PVI than they anticipated using. Um, so there's more involvement of the private um, voluntary independent sector than they predicted at the beginning of this expansion. 
Um, and you're right, that is precisely where we see the greatest flexibility. However, we are seeing increased flexibility in local authority provision, so there are many more local authority nurseries open from eight till six, um, 52 weeks a year. And I would expect that particular aspect to continue um, to um, progress. There are um, at this moment in time. I mean, at this moment in time, early learning and childcare is only open to key workers and vulnerable um, children. As we um, progress, hopefully, towards um, a more um, normal and full opening, um, and particularly come August 2021, I would expect to see that flexibility um, uh, increase. Um, Mr. Johnson mentioned about how we're all very aware of the need for early learning and childcare because of the pandemic. The learning of the pandemic has been just how vital this provision is and what an incredible support it is to families. But our focus has always been on quality of provision um, to children and part a secondary part of the uh, of the programme has been in, in ensuring that families get the support that they need and the flexibility that they need. And funding follows the child, which ultimately, when it is fully rolled out, um, will deliver that. It will put the power into the parents' hands to choose the type of childcare that suits their family, to choose the hours and the provision, including childminding, which is a topic we've talked about many times before as well. So um, I believe when uh, August 2021, when this is fully rolled out, we will see um, funding follows the child and power being in parents' hands to choose the type of childcare that suits them. Mr. Green. Thank you. Uh, just a quick follow up. Uh, can I thank the minister for that helpful answer? And uh, I, I, I think we all hope that is the case. That the proof will very much uh, be be in the pudding. Uh, one of the other areas of concern raised, which I wonder uh, if the policy will assist with the sustainability of the PVI sector uh, and, of course, the role of childminders as well, which is an important one. Um, one of the key uh, issues raised by uh, individual nurseries, certainly that I have spoken to, uh, is around the rate negotiated with their local authority. I absolutely accept that those are negotiations between uh, councils and, and uh, nurseries who choose to participate uh, in the 1140 scheme. But uh, the feedback uh, generally has been that there seems to be a presumption to uh, uh, either bias towards uh, provision of services to use that funding for council-operated nurseries, and indeed just a, a pure limitation on the budget uh, that the council has to negotiate with the PVI sector. So I just wonder if the minister had any thoughts on uh, if, there were, if we're likely to see any improvements in some of those rates or the average uh, rates that are paid out to the PVI sector to make those the place is more sustainable, because often we're told that uh, that, that we're heavily subsidising those with private paying uh, uh, places in the PVI sector, which is completely unsustainable for those who choose to participate uh, in the government scheme. So um, I might ask um, my colleague Simon Mayer to say a little bit more about um, this um, particular issue. But the payment of sustainable rates to funded providers has been absolutely um, vital in terms of supporting financial sustainability right throughout this pandemic. The landmark multi-year funding agreement reached by Scottish Government and COSLA in April 2018 fully funded, fully funded the expansion, and it included funding for the payment of sustainable rates. And those sustainable rates, we have given extensive guidance. They must reflect the cost of delivery to providers um, from August 2021. Now, um, local authority funding to private and third sectors has increased significantly in recent years. So average rates for delivery of 600 hours increasing um, has increased by 26 per cent over the two years um, between August 2017 and August 2019. In April 2019, we issued um, guidance uh, to local authorities to set sustainable rates for funded providers um, in the private and third sectors, and that included um, child minors. Um, Simon, I'm not sure if there's um, more you would like to add to, to the question of that. It's, a, it's an old question that we've gone over many times, and I, and I genuinely believe um, significant improvements have been made. 
Uh, Mr. Yes, I, I, sorry, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I think I think you've um, covered the main points of the sustainable I think that there is an important point in there about the level of guidance that's been provided to local authorities and the emphasis on um, local authorities working with their partners in the private and voluntary sector to set rates that cover um, the costs uh, and, and the true costs of, of delivering um, 11, 40 hours. Um, just the only addition I would make to your comments would be that um, the a key component of this also is funding for the child, which we've been talking about already. Um, in terms of parents having the ability to move between partners, um, uh, move, move to say, uh, take their provision in partnership uh, settings or local authority settings, and that therefore directs uh, to some extent the um, the use of funding um, in terms of the funding going with the child to the to, to the partnership setting. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Green. Are you content to yes. move on? Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I, I see no other questions, so I think we move to our agenda item three, which is the formal debate on the motion S five M two three nine four nine. And can I now ask the minister to move the motion? Moved. Thank you, Minister. Uh, do any members wish to contribute to the debate? I see no members indicating that they wish to. Um, uh, Minister, would you like to say any final comments? No, thank you. Thank you very much. I will now put the question to committee. The question is that motion S5M 23949 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I believe we are agreed. Thank you very much. The next agenda item is to consider the following negative instruments. Special restrictions on adaptions. Uh, sorry, beg your pardon. Special restrictions on adoptions from Nigeria, Scotland Order 2021 SSI 2021-30. Education miscellaneous amendments, Coronavirus Scotland Regulations 2021 SSI 2021-31. Education fees and student support, EU Exit Scotland Amendment Regulations 2021. SSI 2021-28. Details of these instruments are in paper 4, 5 and 6. Do members have any comments on these instruments? I see no member indicating that. Um, so I'll move to agenda item 5, which is our consideration of Redress Scotland. Redress for Survivors, Historic Child Abuse and Care Scotland Bill, Evidence Session 2. Before um, we do so, can I thank the Minister and her uh, officials for attendance at committee this morning. And um, I can, can confirm I uh, put a message into the chat for members. Um, I'm intending to pause for a comfort break at between 10 and 10.30. If members wish to, to to break before that, if they could indicate by putting break in the chat, and we will now move to consideration of stage two amendments on the bill. Can I welcome to committee cabinet secretary John Swinney, and um, we'll go, move immediately to consideration. And the question is that section twenty seven be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Move to second application in light of new evidence and call amendment 59 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. The Cabinet Secretary to move amendment 59 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener, and uh, good morning. In speaking to these amendments, I would first like to acknowledge the contribution last week on this subject from my colleague, Mr. Neil who raised his concern about the need for further options for survivors should additional information come to light after they have already accepted a redress payment and signed a waiver. I would like to thank Mr Neil for raising this and note that while I think that the amendments I have brought forward in this group today take significant steps to address this concern, I reiterate my commitment to consider further options to address this in advance of Stage 3. If there is more that can be done to strengthen safeguards for, states, for survivors, we will certainly aim to do so. Throughout Stage 1, 
I have listened to the concerns that survivors and representatives of the legal profession have raised about the challenges that can be faced in evidencing an individual's abuse in care. I want to make sure that survivors get the redress payment that properly reflects their experience, and that means ensuring that should material new evidence become available after they have made an application and received a redress payment, they will be able to make a further application based on that new evidence and may be awarded a further redress payment. The amendments I have brought forward look to address the concern the Committee has raised that survivors are asked to take decisions on an all-or-nothing basis, solely relying on the evidence available at the point the redress payment offer is made, with no opportunity to seek a further payment should new evidence come to light. The principal amendment in this group, Amendment 59, will allow a survivor, in light of new evidence, to make a further application to redress Scotland who will decide whether that evidence is sufficient enough to move the determination from one payment level up to another. To maintain the appropriate rigour of the scheme, Redress Scotland will require to be satisfied that there is a reason that the new evidence was not previously provided and that the new evidence justifies a further application. I do not see the need for survivors to rely on this provision as being a common occurrence in the scheme, as the inclusive design and approach to evidence will mean it should rarely be necessary for a survivor to submit new formal evidence in order to have their experience fully recognised by Redress Scotland and reflected in their redress payment. However, it is important that the scheme is flexible and can adapt to the changing landscape of knowledge and evidence in relation to historical child abuse. The other amendments are consequential to Amendment 59 and ensure that the consequences of an application for a further payment are reflected as appropriate in other provisions of the Bill. These amendments further strengthen the survivor focus of the scheme and illustrate that the process and outcomes of redress are different uh, than those available through litigation, where it can be difficult to, re to revisit awards or settlements. I would invite committee members to support the amendments, and I move Amendment 59 that stands in my name. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Um, could members please indicate they wish to take part in the debate on Amendment 59? I'm not seeing any indication. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to wind up? Uh, I have no further comments to add, Convener. Thank you. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 59 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I believe we are agreed. Call Amendment 108 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 59. Master Cabinet Secretary to move. Yeah, move, Convener. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 108 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Question is that section twenty eight be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Uh, move to minor and technical uh, amendments. I call amendment sixty in the name of the cabinet secretary. Group with amendments as shown in the groupings. Cabinet secretary to move the amendment sixty and speak to all amendments in the group. Convener, this group consists of a number of technical amendments in relation to various provisions of the bill. Amendments 60, 101 and 130 are to ensure that for consistency throughout the Bill, references to the term application period will have the meaning provided for in section 29, which sets out the application period for the redress scheme. I have also separately brought forward substantive amendments to section 29 concerning the anticipated duration of the scheme, which will be debated later on today. Amendments 113 and 115 are simply to ensure consistent references in, in provisions of the Bill concerning nominated beneficiaries who may take over redress applications where the original applicants have died. Finally, Amendment 119 amends Section 85 of the Bill concerning the provision of support to persons in connection with an application. This is to clarify that those support provisions apply in relation to both those who have actually applied for redress as well as those who may still be in the process of preparing or considering an application. Accordingly, Convener, I move Amendment 60. Thank you. Um, I do not see any indication of members wishing to take part in the debate. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to wind up? Uh, no, Convener. Thank you. So, thank you. So, the question is that Amendment 60 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? 
<coughs> we are agreed. Move to applications period for submission and prioritisation. I call Amendment 109 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendments 110, 111 and 62. Cabinet Secretary, can I invite you to move Amendment 109 and speak to the all the amendments in the group? Hey, thank you, Convener. Um, I move Amendment Wait, uh, Amendment 109, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, convener. Um, I have it titled have Cabinet Secretary second. as period yeah. for submission and prioritisation. Right, a uh, convener. I the. Uh, Right. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, convener. I'm slightly uh, out of order there. Yeah. Uh, I thank the, com the committee for raising the issue of scheme duration uh, in the stage one report, and I'm in wholehearted agreement with their conclusion that the duration of the application period should not represent a barrier to redress for survivors. Accordingly, I move Amendment 109, which, together with Amendment 110, amends Section 29 of the bill, so that the application period will last for whichever is the longer of either five years or two years beyond the lifetime of the Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry. Although this therefore already provides for potentially longer application periods, there will still be scope to make reg regulations under Section 29.2 of the Bill to extend the application period beyond that. This would be subject to the Parliament's consideration and approval under the affirmative procedure. I have also brought forward Amendment 111 to place a new duty on Ministers to review the length of the application period. This is, that is set under Amendment 110. This must be done 15 months before it is due to end, unless, unless steps have already been taken to extend it. Further, this amendment requires that the findings of this review are published and laid before the Scottish Parliament. I believe these changes will instil confidence that the question of whether to extend the application period will be given thorough and timely consideration, and that there will be transparency around the decision-making process. Subject to Parliament's approval, regulations could then be made to extend the application period in line with the conclusions of that review. While the Bill, as introduced, provided that the redress scheme would be open for a period of five years and gave the Scottish Minister's power to extend this period by way of regulations, the amendments that I am asking the Committee to support today will make sure that the scheme remains open for applications for a substantial period of time after the Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry has concluded and produced its final report. This is to ensure that those who may be encouraged to come forward or to ask for an earlier award to be reviewed as a result of findings of the inquiry will have the opportunity to do so. Also, by providing that the scheme will remain open for a sufficient length of time to take account of potential changes in the evidence available to survivors, we ensure that survivors will have the time they need to fully explore other options available to them. The scheme will be open long enough for survivors to pursue a civil action in the first instance, if that is their preference, and then apply to the redress scheme if they were unsuccessful in the court action or the outcome was a financial award, which is lower uh, than what they might receive by way of a redress payment. Amendment 111 will also guarantee that there is proper consideration of whether or not the application period should be extended beyond the application period being set today under Amendment 110 with appropriate transparency around that. Amendment 62 relates to the requirement that Redress Scotland must have regard to an applicant's age and state of health when determining which applications are to be prioritised. This amendment strengthens what is currently provided for in Section 32 of the Bill to ensure that action is taken um, uh, around ill health when that is also disclosed later on in the application process, including after an application has been submitted to Redress Scotland. Um, I hope that members will support those amendments, and uh, I move Amendment 109. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I have the indication from Mr Johnson he would like to come in. Thank you, uh, Convener. And, and I should say at the outset that, that I, mean, I welcome these amendments. I think it is important that we maximise the opportunities of survivors uh, to make uh, uh, applications. Um, and, and really, I have just got essentially a question as to whether or not 
you, you know, this is um, whether or not we could actually go further than the amendments that are, that are in front of us. I think, especially bearing in mind that it, it can take many people a, a number of years to come to terms with the experiences they have and to even acknowledge them to themselves, let alone to others. Uh, and also given the length of time that has passed. And I really have got a, a simple question for the Cabinet Secretary is, why does there need to be a finite period for, for applications to be made at all? And while I acknowledge that in the early years uh, that you would expect that the, 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 the bulk of applications to come forward, I, I, I'm not entirely clear, in, at least in principle, and I, I, I recognise maybe practical reasons, why the, there should be any uh, time limit uh, whatsoever. I was just wondering if the Cabinet Secretary could maybe set out the, the logic and thinking behind that. Cabinet Secretary. Um, thanks, Convener. I, I think that, I suppose in, in, in answer to Mr Johnson's question, there's not an absolutely precise answer. It's a, it's a matter of judgment. Um, the, um, the, the, the thinking behind the timescales has been to essentially provide um, an opportunity for applications to be made. Um, we've extended that timescale beyond the duration of the uh, reporting of the Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry to provide adequate opportunity for um, individuals to come forward. There is also provision within the Bill um, for ministers to extend that timescale should they judge that to be appropriate. Now, I suppose there is, a, there is an argument, and I, and I do accept this point from Mr Johnson, that we might never know the moment at which an individual finds it possible to address these issues, and that may not be within the timescale that is being prescribed by the Bill. That might be some time afterwards. I take his point that somebody may be able to face up to these issues long after the scheme um, has formally um, reached the timescales that are set out here. Uh, and they have, I suppose, just as much right to have their circumstances addressed as anybody else. So I, I'm, I'm happy to reflect further on that point um, in advance of stage three. Um, I think that there are provisions in the bill for the timescales to be extended, but I don't think extended in the fashion that Mr Johnson highlights, which is that scenario where some years later, an individual is able to face up to all of these issues and wishes to pursue them. So I, I am certainly prepared to give the committee a commitment that I will consider that point in advance of stage three, um, in addition to the changes that are proposed in this section of amendments. Mr Johnson, do you wish to come back in? Uh, no, not really, uh, uh, but I thank the Cabinet Secretary for those remarks. Okay. Uh, can I, Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to say anything further? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I, I would leave it there, Convener. Thank you. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 109 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 110 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with Amendment 109 and ask the Cabinet Secretary to move. It moves, Convener. Question is that Amendment 110 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And I call Amendment 111 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 109, and ask the Cabinet Secretary to move. It moves, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 111 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section <clears throat> 29 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And the question is that section 30 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Move to initial determinations and call amendment 61 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Cabinet Secretary can invite you to move amendment 61 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. I move Amendment 61 in my name. Uh, last week, I said to the committee that I want to make sure that the operation of waiver is fair to survivors. Some of the views that the committee heard at stage one and that the government has heard throughout the engagement with survivors indicated that the provisions within the bill around interim payments could undermine that objective. 
particularly as the concern that some survivors could choose to sign a waiver before knowing the final outcome of their individually assessed redress application and, crucially, whether or not they are satisfied with that. Whilst the option to receive an interim payment was only ever intended to increase survivor choice, given the concerns raised and the commitment I gave in the Stage 1 debate, and today bringing forward amendments which will remove the concept of interim payments in relation to individually assessed applications. The principal amendment, Amendment 68, removes Section 36 of the Bill, which is the source of Redress Scotland's duty to make an initial determination. The other amendments make consequential adjustments to the other provisions of the Bill, which refer to initial determinations, including the provisions on waiver. These amendments will mean that survivors who apply for individually assessed payments will only ever be asked to sign a waiver when they know the final outcome of their application and the full details of any redress payment they are being offered. As I have said before, the, pre the process of redress is intended to be faster than civil litigation and intended to feel different to traditional court-based processes. That will be uppermost in our minds as we progress with scheme design and build capacity to deliver. We will make sure, in all respects possible, that the processes and timescales to consider and assess applications deliver a swifter, more accessible, survivor-focused and trauma-informed alternative to court proceedings. The Bill also provides that Redress Scotland must prioritise applications having regard to the age and health of applicants. This will allow the elderly and those with significant health issues the opportunity to have their applications determined promptly and to receive their full individually assessed payments as quickly as possible thereafter. These amendments are part of a package of Stage 2 amendments that are designed to enhance Mr. Swinney? Mr. Swinney, I think you're back. We lost your co connection there. Um, so we, right. we missed the last few few sentences, I, I, I believe, uh, if you want to. Okay. Um, the, if I perhaps just say that the amendments um, are, are part of a package of Stage 2 amendments that are designed to enhance the protection for survivors. And I would ask the committee to support this group of amendments for the reasons that I've set out. Okay. And can I confirm that you moved Amendment 61, Cabinet Secretary? I, I did at the very beginning, Kajira, yes. Thank, I, I, thank, I, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Can, um, I don't see any indication of members wishing to take part in the debate. So, um, uh, Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to wind up? Uh, no, thanks, Kajira. Thank you. So, the question is that Amendment 61 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Uh, the question is that section 31 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 62 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with Amendment 109 and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moved, Kavina. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 62 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that section 32 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And the question is that section 33 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. We move to determination of applications and call Amendment 25 in the name of Daniel Johnson, grouped with Amendment 63, 112, 104 and 104A. I can invite Mr. Johnson to move Amendment 25 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Convener. I, I think it's a fair reflection of the evidence that the committee took and indeed the discussions and deliberations that the committee uh, 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 carried out, both in public and in private, that I think the most sensitive and delicate uh, issue uh, within uh, the, the Redress Scotland and the way it's proposed to work, it is the determinations of individual payments that they'll be making. In essence, we are asking Redress Scotland to, to, to determine both the veracity 
and indeed the seriousness of the, the, the uh, testimony that they will be receiving from survivors. Uh, this is clearly uh, a very delicate matter, a very sensitive one, and one that needs to be uh, 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 carried out with that in mind, but also uh, that, that it's carried out in a robust uh, 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 and understandable manner. And therefore, understanding both the burden of proof that will be applied to applications and the evidential requirements for the testimony and the information that is provided by applicants to this process is really critically important. As it stands, uh, the way uh, that these matters will be determined will be subject to, to, to guidance. And I, uh, and indeed the committee, questioned whether or not that was uh, robust enough uh, for the purposes of uh, Redress Scotland. Now, I understand that uh, the, the uh, intent behind this was to provide sufficient flexibility, that given the, the difficult nature of uh, the, the subject matter and indeed the, 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 the time and the complexity uh, uh, surrounding those things, that it was important to have flexibility. And while I recognise that, I also think we have to bear in mind the, the independence under which uh, Redress Scotland will be carrying out its work, that once this uh, body is set up, and running, it will be very much uh, uh, running independent of, of government, and I think that is right and correct. Therefore, I think it is important that we set out these principles that it will be working under in terms of the evidential requirements of burden proof on the face of the bill. I think it is important we continue to have flexibility. So that is why, in Amendment 25, what I seek to do is set out a number of principles under which uh, these applications can be determined, and indeed the the, the burden of proof uh, that they will uh, 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 that will be applied. And I think that's important to provide both clarity for people applying, so that they understand what will be required of them, how things will be understood, and in terms of having legal robustness, so that, that we have on the face of the bill the principles under which. Uh, those uh, decisions will be made so that they can be scrutinised and challenged legally if that is required. Now, uh, those principles will then be uh, uh, expanded and, and uh, 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 made more substantial uh, through regulation. And again, I think that is important in terms of providing that flexibility that was initially sought, but also recognising that these issues are complicated and, and therefore uh, require a, 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 a more substantial. Um, uh, elaboration than is set out uh, uh, here. Now, if I could also just explain some of the details. So, in subsection three, I set out key questions. Now, I acknowledge um, that these are, are complex, these are untested, but what I sought to do was uh, provide key principles uh, by which uh, we could sensitively, uh, uh, Redress Scotland could sensitively, but also uh, 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 coherently um, uh, assess uh, 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 evidence that it received from survivors, and I thought it is important that that that, that we essentially do not have uh, uh, principles which may put undue stress on individuals. Therefore, I think it is important that that we have an assumption of, of uh, coherence regarding evidence. That's to move away from ideas of consistency, which I think sometimes are, is problematic for survivors, given the stress and trauma that they've endured, they do not necessarily have. They may not have necessarily given consistent accounts over time, or even uh, in a specific period. But what is important is that we that the evidence is looked at and look at, at whether or not it is coherent within the broader context of the experiences that they uh, endured, uh, and, and also whether it is it fits within the pattern. Of uh, mm -hmm. other uh, uh, survivors' uh, evidence and the information that we know about the broader context within which uh, that they may have endured uh, the abuse that they suffered, which is where, in Part B, that I talk about uh, uh, the applicant uh, evidence may be inferred from other accounts. Uh, I also think it's important that there is a presumption that applicants are to be believed, and I note Alec Neal's uh, uh, amendment, which comes later in this group. Uh, in subsection, uh, subsection three, part D, um, I think it's important that actually the, over, the overarching responsibility falls with Redress Scotland rather than the individual applicant. This will be traumatic and it will be difficult. And if we are seeking a process which is substantially different to going through court, I think it is important that, that there is an obligation 
for Redress Scotland not to be a passive body that simply receives evidence on behalf of applicants, but actually seeks to, 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 to uh, uh, establish facts itself in partnership uh, uh, with the applicant. Uh, and, and indeed, I think it's also important that we do not ask uh, survivors to produce uh, evidence or give testimony where they have done so elsewhere. Th this is uh, quite a, 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 a powerful uh, personal uh, representation that was made to me um, following our initial evidence taking, that, that many survivors have given their stories time and time again. Every time they do so, they relive their experience, and it is traumatic. So where that evidence has already been provided, and I think in particular to uh, the inquiry, I think it's important that is taken into account, that that is used as a primary source, and that we do not require survivors to retell their stories where they do not have to, where they've already told their stories elsewhere. And I think it's also important to, to establish that this, uh, the standard proof should be no higher than the balance of uh, probability. So I hope that that sets out my logic. Now, with all of this, and I, and I apologise that I've gone on at some length, but I think this is a complicated area. I, I, I recognise that a, an awful lot of these principles are, are, are untested. I, I recognise that there will be significant legal complexity, and therefore I'm setting these out as, as probing amendments, and I'm minded not to press them. Um, uh, when we come to that point. But what I would uh, like to do is establish both the Cabinet Secretary and other members whether they think that, that the principles either along these lines may be appropriate. And I certainly think that the, 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 there must be, uh, on the face of the bill, setting out of more substantial principles than are both currently set out, but also that would be provided for in other amendments in this group. Because I think it's important that we have legal robustness and we have clarity for those seeking to, to make applications to redress Scotland. And I'll finish there. Thank you, Mr Johnson. Can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to speak to Amendment 63 and the other amendments in the group? Um, thank you very much, Kavira. Uh, can I begin, Kavira, by thanking Mr Johnson for bringing forward Amendment 25? Um, I agree in principle with the elements of the approach set out in this amendment, some of which have been included in my own amendment on the standard of proof and in Mr Neil's amendment on the presumption of truth. We all want the redress scheme to operate with integrity, robustness, but without placing unduly onerous burdens on survivors. Uh, on this particular point, I agree very much with the sentiments that Mr Johnson has put forward, and uh, I, I in no way um, do I wish to see further trauma being inflicted on survivors by the process of application that is envisaged under this bill? Indeed, um, my contention would be that the approach that we are taking is trying to minimise that trauma where we possibly can do to make sure that individuals are able to obtain redress without that the trauma that um, Mr Johnson referred to. Now, there are a number of practical and technical issues with Mr Johnson's proposal, and I welcome the fact that he has said to committee that these are amendments are put forward on um, uh, as probing amendments, because I would be very happy, um, subject what once the committee has disposed of these sections of the bill, to reflect with Mr Johnson on whether there are, are any further outstanding issues that need to be addressed. To take into account the points that he, the legitimate points that he has raised within these uh, amendments, I think there is a, a, a judgment, and it, it, it runs through a number of the comments that um, I, 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 I could make in this section about just how much detail is on the face of the bill and how much is left to the um, to, to the guidance that we put in place. But I, I would be happy to engage further with Mr. Johnson on these points. Uh, once the committee has expressed its view on the various amendments in this succession in, in this section, so um, I, uh, if I uh, could, could sum up those observations by saying that I share Mr. Johnson's commitment to a trauma-informed approach, and I would uh, want to apply that test to the provisions of the bill um, once the committee has completed its scrutiny here in advance of stage three. Um, on the idea of a presumption that application, applicants are to be believed, I am committed to delivering a scheme which tells survivors from the outset that we believe them. This is important when so often in the past they were not believed. 
I give my support to amendments 112 and 104A put forward by Mr Neil, which calls for a presumption of truth in the bill. Um, I thank Mr Neil for this amendment, which maintains the integrity of the scheme by electing the presumption of truth as the starting point, while leaving the panel the flexibility they require to ensure decision making is robust and credible. This supports our non and adversarial approach to all aspects of the redress scheme. It recognises the challenges for individuals having to disclose abuse, and it underlines our commitment to a trauma informed approach and to providing practical and emotional support to applicants throughout the application process and beyond. I will now turn further to Government Amendments 63 and 104. I have heard the evidence from the Committee and reflected on calls from survivors and organisations for greater clarity as to the standard of proof which will apply in determining redress applications. I have brought forward this amendment to provide a civil standard of proof on balance of probabilities. This means that something was um, more likely than not to have occurred. Survivors have asked for a standard of proof that provides clarity for the applicant and which safeguards the integrity of the scheme. Organisations need to be confident that their contributions will relate to redress payments determined by the panel in accordance with a clear and consistent standard of proof. This amendment provides the clarity sought. While the standard of proof applied by this amendment is the same as the civil standard, it is not the case that this means that the process would be the same as in a civil court. The civil court rules on admissibility of evidence are not applied to the redress scheme by this amendment or otherwise, and the matters which require to be demonstrated only to eligibility, not to liability. Adversarial processes and the need to establish liability has no place in the redress scheme. The practical measures put in place through the design of the scheme will more broadly support survivors to access redress, helping them access, so far as is possible, any and all available information and evidence to support their application in meeting the desired standard of proof. It was always intended that redress decisions would be taken to a clear and consistent standard. It is vital to ensure that all of us, including survivors, organisations and others, have confidence that decisions on redress applications will be based on a clear and appropriately robust standard of proof. The balance of probabilities provides that confidence. I therefore ask the Committee to support my amendments 63 and 104, as well as Mr Neill's amendments. And, um, I would invite Mr Johnson not to press his amendment, uh, but I, I would give the undertaking that I will engage constructively uh, with him uh, and with the Committee on what further steps need to be taken to address any of the issues that remain outstanding from the, that he has raised in, in, this, uh, in Amendment 25. Thank you, Thank Cabinet you. Secretary. Can I invite Mr Neill to speak to Amendment 112 and other amendments in the group? Thank, thank you very much indeed, uh, Convener. In moving 112, can I first of all thank Daniel Johnson and the Cabinet Secretary for their uh, supportive comments in relation to Amendment 112 and the consequential Amendment 104A. In moving this amendment, I would like to say that survivors of historical abu abuse in CAIA have campaigned, as we all know, with dedication and perseverance for access to justice to, and redress. There are too many times in the past where survivors have taken the brave step to disclose abuse experience but were not heard or, indeed, not believed. And I've heard, like everyone else from the committee and the cabinet secretary, from survivors, and they've stated that being heard, being believed, and having their abuse acknowledged is an important element in accessing justice, and for many, is vital to help individuals move forward. In response to these calls, I bring forward this amendment placing a presumption of truth on the face of the bill. Applications will be in, applicants will be in no doubt that when they are applying to the redress scheme, that the default position is that they are believed. This amendment forms part of an unwavering commitment to listen to survivors and act with dignity, respect and compassion in acknowledging and accepting the truth of the abuse that they have suffered in care. The presumption of truth will work alongside the standard of proof 
Together, they will reinforce the supportive and trauma-informed approach to survivors and to the robust review of applications, each element promoting confidence in the scheme. Survivors can be assured that they will be believed, and that will be on the face of the bill. Thank you, convener. Thank you, Mr. Neil. Um, I invite members to take part in the debate, and I'll Mr. Green first, please. Thank you. Just two brief comments uh, further to the amendments in this group. One is around the evidence threshold. Uh, I think, in theory, uh, we certainly would have supported uh, Mr. Johnson's amendments, perhaps on a basis of principle rather than technicality. I appreciate there are some difficulties in, in the, the wording used, but uh, I, I think this idea that the evidence provided must be proportionate to the award given is a, a fair principle, uh, and, and I'm, I'm hoping the government will, will consider that. But, but the only issue I did take was that around that uh, those participating in the scheme should not have to uh, present evidence already given. I think, in, in theory, that, that, that is ideal, uh, but we're not always uh, in an ideal situation. There may be instances or cases where it may be necessary for the panel who are making the award uh, to request evidence or information. I think that would be a fair ask uh, of participants uh, in the scheme. But again, it comes back to that first principle of the proportionality of the evidence required, given the nature of the scheme, it is very different from that of civil action. So I think I think we should and could avoid all cases, but uh, I, I think the scheme needs to be given the flexibility to empower the panel members themselves to uh, you know uh, make reasonable and rational decisions around what they think is required of them to allow them to make a decision, uh, because what might seem in uh, quite easy in theory to us in, in practical and on, a, on the face of a bill would be quite difficult. So I look forward to seeing how, how Mr. Johnson and the Cabinet Secretary progress that. But I do think we would support any measures in, uh, and future amendments to stage three uh, to make this as easy as possible for those to come forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Green. Can I bring in Mr. Mandel? Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Um, like uh, Jamie Green, I, I'm supportive of, of Daniel Johnson's approach, uh, whilst recognising there are uh, technical issues with his amendments, and I'm keen to see uh, what progress is made um, ahead of stage three. Um, but I wanted to uh, draw uh, the Cabinet Secretary's um, attention to just a comment um, that, that Alec Neil uh, made. Um, in relation to the interaction between the presumption of truth uh, and, and the standard of, of proof uh, required, because um, there's an area that I've been concerned about at uh, stage one, um, and you know, it continues to concern me now, uh, which is just the, how uh, those um, who uh, can uh, provide uh, documentation or evidence uh, will be treated, uh, where they can provide circumstantial evidence um, and can provide uh, other you know, compelling information um, you know, that, that you know, most reasonable people uh, outside of a court process would, would recognise you know, would, would meet a balance of probabilities test, you know, but whether they're not able to whether they're not able to provide uh, hard evidence, uh, will will uh, you know, a sworn statement, for example, uh, or uh, remarks they've made previously uh, to to the inquiry uh, be, be taken. Um, you know, as being enough evidence, um, what what happens where, where documentation doesn't exist, and how do these two uh, principles uh, in, interact when they're both on the face of the bill? Um, I, I'd but just be keen to, to get a better understanding of that in the closing remarks. So, Mr. Mandel, the, the cabinet secretary has requested to intervene, uh, uh, and I'll bring I'll in Mr. Very happy to, very happy to do that. I'm grateful to Mr. Mundell for accepting the intervention. I, I don't have the opportunity to, to sum up on this section, so it, it gives me a chance to respond to the legitimate points that Mr. Mundell has raised. And what I would hope um, members would conclude is that the support that I'm offering to Mr. Neil's amendment, that there is essentially a, a presumption of truth being told by uh, applicants. Combined with the standard of proof that 
we are applying in my own amendments on the balance of probabilities, meaning that something was more likely than not to have occurred, provides a framework which um, addresses the points that Mr. Mandel is raising, because I think you know I accept that documentary evidence will be unlikely to be available in almost in every circumstance to um, a level of certainty that would um, satisfy other tests within the judicial system. Indeed, I think it is quite interesting to reflect on the approach that has been taken by the Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry, which has essentially, you know, in my layman's explanation of that, has felt to me very much as if the, uh, those presenting evidence, survivors presenting evidence, have been believed from the outset. And I think that has enabled that inquiry to produce such powerful reflections on the issues about which we are all troubled. And I have tried to reflect some of that thinking in the amendments the government has brought forward, and which I am happy to support in relation to the points that Mr. Neil has brought forward. So I hope that uh, goes some way to addressing the points that Mr. Mundell um, legitimately has raised here, and which I acknowledge he raised in stage one as well. Mr. Mundell? Uh, that's exceptionally uh, helpful, uh, Convener. I am grateful to the Cabinet Secretary. I know that that will provide a lot of reassurance. Uh, to survivors and, and victims, and I think these changes will. Come. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm just briefly, uh, Mr. Adam, did you want to come in? Okay, that's fine. Sorry, there was a, a message in the chat we weren't sure about. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to invite Mr. Johnson to wind up and to press or withdraw his amendment. Thank you very much, Convener. Can I thank uh, uh, the comments both of the Cabinet Secretary and other committee members uh, in this <clears throat> section? Uh, first of all, uh, let me acknowledge that I think that uh, Alec Neil's amendments and, and those of the governments in this section do, I think, move us uh, forward. However, I think that you, the comments of both Jamie Green and Oliver Mundell, I, I think, point to the fact that I think there is at least, I think, scope to look whether or not uh, we could move further. Uh, it, it, it is a simple fact that, that many survivors will, uh, I think, uh, struggle to provide documentary evidence. They will have provided uh, evidence elsewhere. And I think we need to be mindful of the fact that Redress Scotland will not just be determining whether or not they think uh, the, the, the testimony is true, but also uh, in establishing the degree to which uh, uh, the, 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 the trauma uh, uh, or, or the extent of that uh, 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 in, in the particular circumstances uh, of the applicant, because they are going to have to discriminate between different payment levels, and we are obviously coming on to that in the next section. So it's not just a question of, of, of establishing whether or not these things occurred, but also the extent of them. And I think because of that, I think we, 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 we I think we do require to both, I think, further elaborate on, on what are the valid uh, ways in which uh, Redress Scotland could substantiate those testimonies. And I think that's really the point that, that, that Oliver Mundell was getting at. And I think that's very much what I was uh, seeking to uh, probe uh, with the uh, principle of uh, inferring um, evidence from the accounts of other applicants or, or the wider uh, context. Uh, but I think it's also uh, very important, as Jamie Green was pointing out, that, that, that Redress Scotland uh, does seek evidence that may be available uh, elsewhere. Um, but but uh, I, I do also acknowledge uh, the complexity here, so I will not press Amendment 25, and I do urge uh, other members to support uh, the, the amendments in the name of John Sunny and Alex Neil. Thank you very much, Mr Johnson. Um, can I call Amendment 63 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with Amendment 25 and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally? It moved, Kavira. 
Thank you. The question is that Amendment 63 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 112 in the name of Alex Neal, already debated with Amendment 25, and invite Mr Neal to move. Move. Thank move. you. Ms. Thank you, Mr Neal. Uh, the question is that Amendment 112 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. We move to finding a fact, and I call Amendment 64 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, put with Amendment 66 and 97. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 64 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Convener, a fundamental aspect of the redress scheme is its non-adversarial nature. It is intended to be an alternative to a court-based process, and its purpose is not to determine liability for abuse in a way that a court would, or in a way that would have legal consequences outside the redress scheme itself. Rather, its purpose is to provide tangible recognition of abuse and a survivor-focused and non-adversarial route to redress. It thus, Section 34.3 states that when determining an application, Redress Scotland must not make any determinations on any issues of fault or negligence. Further, Section 34.6 provides that neither the making of an offer nor the failure to make an offer is to be construed as a finding that a person named in an application acted in a particular way. In the evidence received during Stage 1, concern was expressed that these provisions might prevent Redress Scotland from determining whether abuse actually took place. This is certainly not the intention. Indeed, making such determinations is obviously essential to the performance of its functions. In our view, it is entirely possible for Redress Scotland to make a determination that abuse occurred without having to make a specific finding as to whose fault or negligence led to that abuse. However, it is clear that the concerns raised relate not to the principle of these provisions, but only to how they are expressed, and I am content to bring forward these amendments to clarify our intention. Amendment 64 amends Section 34.3 to, produce, to provide that Redress Scotland has no power to rule on or determine any person's civil or criminal liability when considering a redress application, as that would be the role of a court. The intended effect of this is to make it clearer that whilst Redress Scotland has no power to do these things, it will nonetheless be able to make determinations on the key question of whether or not abuse took place for the purpose of offering a redress payment. The purpose of Amendment 66 is to put, is to put beyond doubt that neither the offer of redress nor the failure to make such an offer can be relied on in, either, in other court proceedings as evidence that the acts complained, complained of occurred. This was already the intention, but the amended wording of this provision puts beyond the question that what we are talking about here is, the, is how the outcome of a redress application is viewed in other proceedings. For the sake of consistency, I am also bringing forward Amendment 97, which amends Section 72.6. This provision contains similar wording to Section 34.6, but in the context of a reconsideration of a determination where there has been a possible material error. Similarly to Amendment 66, Amendment 97 is intended to put beyond doubt that for the purposes of other proceedings, nothing done under a reconsideration is to be taken as a finding that someone acted or failed to act in a way suggested in the application for redress. Accordingly, I move Amendment 64. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I have no indications from any members that they wish to come in at this stage. And I therefore would uh, ask if the Cabinet Secretary wishes to wind up. I have no further comments to add, Kadir. Thank you. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 64 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Amendment, I call Amendment 65 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 61, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moved, Kavir. So the question is that Amendment 65 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 66 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 64, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moved, Kavir. 
Thank you. The question is that Amendment 66 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And the question is that Section 34 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 67 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 59, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moved, Kavina. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 67 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And the question is that Section 35 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 5 in the name of Ian Gray, already debated with Amendment 1, and invite Ian Gray to move or not move. Not moved. Thank you, Mr Gray. Um, I call Amendment 68 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 61, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move. Move, Kavina. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 68 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Can I, I now move to the question that Section 37 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Okay, I'm just going to pause a second to check with my clerks that I have done that in the correct order. Yep, um, I have indeed, thank, <laughs> thankfully. Um, can we move to payment amounts? And I call Amendment 69 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Group with amendments as shown in the groupings. And I draw members' attention to the pre-emption information shown in the groupings. If Amendment 27 is agreed, I cannot call Amendment 71, 72 or 73. So I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 69 and speak to all amendments in the group. Convener, before discussing the amendments in this group directly, I would like to begin by acknowledging the sensitivity of this part of our debate today. It is one of many difficult topics within the context of redress. I know that members of the committee have said they are uncomfortable with drawing lines between experiences of abuse and then attaching a monetary value to each level. I share that discomfort. And again, I must say that we know that no amount of money can adequately reflect the reality of abuse and the harm caused. Nothing we discuss here should be considered to diminish any abuse experienced by us, any survivor. But if we are to provide individualised payments, as survivors have asked us to do, this is a discussion that we must have. The work on the assessment framework will continue so that survivors have clarity when considering applying for redress. We must recognise that not all experiences of abuse are the same, and that it is right that the redress scheme provides for those distinctions in a way which is fair and which makes sense for survivors. The matter of payment levels is then a critical but sensitive one. I have carefully considered the evidence the Committee heard during Stage 1. I want to provide fair payments according to a fair structure that is sensitive to the needs and circumstances of those who apply to the scheme. I have revisited the level of the increase between the different payment levels. I have brought forward an amendment, which is Amendment 71, to introduce a new £60,000 payment level to address concerns that the gap between the current 40,000 and 80,000 payment levels in the bill is too great. Amendment 72 is consequential to that. I have also considered the evidence heard by the Committee during Stage 1 that, in some cases, redress payments may be lower than would have been awarded by the courts or provided by some other redress schemes. The redress scheme is an alternative remedy for survivors. It does not follow the same rules and procedures as court and is not designed to achieve the same outcome. The redress scheme is driven by the needs of survivors and is designed to operate in a supportive and non-adversarial way, while still providing contributions from the organisations responsible. It is important, then, that the redress scheme offers choice in the form of a meaningful alternative. So, having listened to the evidence, in particular the views of survivors, 
I've also brought forward an amendment, Amendment 73, to introduce a new top-level payment of £100,000. A revised financial memorandum will be published to set out what impact this will have on the anticipated cost of the scheme if that amendment is passed today. Amendments 69 and 70 are further consequential amendments. These payment levels will allow survivors' experiences to be further differentiated and the application process to be further individualised. I note that Mr Johnson has also brought forward amendments to payment levels through his amendments 26 and 27. While I agree with the need to increase the top level payment, I believe that Mr Johnson's suggestion that there should in effect be no upper limit presents a number of challenges. The biggest of these is that the lack of, a, of clear parameters around the payments available leads to a lack of transparency for survivors either in advance of applying or once they have received an offer of a redress payment. There would also be difficulties in seeking contributions from providers worried about affordability when payment amounts would have no upper limit. This could therefore undermine other measures we have considered and debated previously, which seek to ensure the affordability of financial contributions for providers and secure their contributions. We should provide clarity for survivors wherever we can. Mr Johnson's amendment would instead provide uncertainty around the payment levels available and how decisions were made. It would also be likely to increase the number of requests for a review of decisions, slowing the settlement of applications and the capacity for the redress scheme to help survivors move swiftly through what is undeniably an emotional process. I have listened to the points raised by Mr Johnson previously in respect of those survivors whose experience may take them to the highest level of redress payment available. As with all applicants, and perhaps even more than others, it is right that those survivors have the opportunity to access independent legal advice, that they know the options available to them, and that they can carefully consider whether pursuing court action said would be in their best interest. Supporting survivors to make the right choice for them would, I suggest, not be helped by failing to provide clear levels of redress payment available. A matter could, that could further be explored, however, is how the scheme makes sure that survivors are adequately signposted to the alternative paths available to financial redress, paths that may, for some, result in higher settlements than those that can be afforded by the redress scheme. I note Daniel Johnson's powerful contributions on this matter previously, and I do not want to see, and I do want to see what more can be done in this matter, whether by stage three amendment or otherwise. I have listened to the concerns about payment levels voiced to the committee, and as I set out previously, I am bringing forward my amendments to this group to introduce two further individually assessed payment levels, one at sixty thousand and one at one hundred thousand pounds. I believe that these strike the right balance and respond to the concerns we have heard while still ensuring there is certainty and transparency. I would therefore ask that Mr Johnson does not press his amendments today, and I move Amendment 69. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Can I invite Mr Johnson to speak to Amendment 26 and other amendments in the group? Thank you, uh, Convener. I can begin by acknowledging that I think the amendments brought forward by the Cabinet Secretary I think uh, move us forward quite substantially, uh, both in terms of the £60,000 uh, payment uh, level, because I think that does uh, remove the quite large uh, jump in payment levels between uh, the, the 40 and 80,000 pound levels, and I think that's important. Likewise, I also welcome the introduction of the 100,000 uh, pound payment uh, level, and I think that again is useful. But I, I think it's important to acknowledge uh, two uh, critical things. Uh, first of all, there may well be people who come forward with uh, uh, experiences that are uh, uh, you know, very serious indeed, uh, and may well be successful if pursued uh, by uh, through the courts, and, and indeed experiences which, if they were pursued by courts, may attract a much more generous uh, payment than is currently available through Redress Scotland. Uh, and, and while I fully acknowledge that it is the, the choice of people to pursue the, the avenues that they do and to choose uh, an application through Redress Scotland rather than through the courts, Nonetheless, I think it's still problematic, certainly for me, um, that, 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 that we could have a scheme that, that would knowingly, uh, I think, settle uh, those claims 
and in such a way that those, th th those individuals would have no further possibility of pursuing their claims through the courts, that, that would be substantially less than they might uh, uh, receive if they did do so. I think it's critically important that Redress Scotland acts in the best interests of, of uh, survivors, uh, both in terms of the way it handles their claims, but also uh, the awards that it makes. And the intention behind my amendment was therefore to remove the upper limit so that Redress Scotland could make uh, a, 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 a larger payments on an exceptional basis. Now, I acknowledge that that, that, that would require further fleshing out, uh, but I think it, it's an important consideration to make. It's a point that I've made uh, in the, the first session of amendments that we took uh, last week in terms of those circumstances uh, of individuals being able to receive higher claims and the need for Redress Scotland to act in their best interest. So I would ask the Cabinet Secretary to consider whether or not there, there should be provision in the bill for uh, exceptional payments uh, with whatever caveats may be deemed uh, uh, warranted so that Redress Scotland, in, in circumstances where it is very clear that, that uh, large awards could be achieved, uh, that it is able to make uh, such an award on an exceptional basis. And I will conclude there. Thank you, Mr Johnson. Um, I do not see indications from any other members that they wish to come in, so I would invite a cabinet secretary to wind up. Thank you, Kavina. Um, there is, uh, I, I acknowledge the, the points that Mr Johnson has made, and I, and I, I think I addressed a lot of them in the comments that I made before, so to stay with the committee, uh, I will not rehearse them. Mr Johnson did raise one specific um, scenario, which of, is of the provision for um, payments in truly exceptional cases. I think the difficulty here is that such provision would, I think, conflict with the aspiration to have transparency within the system. And I think transparency is essential so that all applicants know where they stand. They know the parameters of the scheme that are available. They know what they are making a judgment about, which then enables them to make a judgment as to whether the scheme is for them or whether they wish to reserve the right to pursue civil litigation, which of course lies at the heart of survivor choice. Now, I'm, I'm certainly very happy to give further consideration to the points that Mr Johnson has put on the record today in advance of stage three. Um, I, I, I can acknowledge the, uh, the issue that he raises, but I would be concerned that it potentially undermines the transparency of the scheme. But I do give the committee an undertaking that I will reflect on that further and would be happy to discuss uh, this issue with um, uh, with Mr. Johnson um, uh, in advance of stage three, and I conclude my remarks there, conveners. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The question is that Amendment sixty nine be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Call Amendment seventy in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with Amendment sixty nine. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moves, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 70 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 26 in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with Amendment 69, and invite Mr Johnson to move or not move? Not moved, Kimura. Thank you, Mr Johnson. I call Amendment 27 in the name of Mr Johnson, already debated with Amendment 69. I invite Mr Johnson to move or not move. Not moved. Thank you very much. Call amendments 71, 72, and 73, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. Invite the Cabinet Secretary to move amendment 71 to 73 on block. It moves on block, convener. Does any member object? A single question has been put on amendment 71 to 73. Well, the question is that Amendment 71 to 73 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 74 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 59, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Uh, move, Kavir. Yeah, the question is that Amendment 74 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And can I call Amendment 75 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, 
Already debated with Amendment 59, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moved, Kavira. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 75 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 38 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 39 to 41 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendments 76, 77 and 78, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendments 76 to 78 on block. It moved on block, Kavina. Does any member object? A single question being put on Amendment 76 to 78. The question is that Amendment 76 to 78 are agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 42 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And the question is that Section 43 and 44 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 79? 80, 81, 82, 83 and 84, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. Can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 79 to 84 on block? It moved on block, Kavina. Does any member object? A single question being put on Amendment 79 to 84. The question is that Amendment 79 to 84 are agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 6 in the name of Ian Gray, already debated with Amendment 1, and invite Mr Gray to move or not move. Not moved. The question is that Section 45 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Thank you. I call Amendment 7 in the name of Ian Gray, already debated with Amendment 1. I invite Mr Gray to move or not move. Not moved. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Section 46 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 85 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 57? I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moved again. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 85 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 47 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Call Amendment 8 in the name of Ian Gray, already debated with Amendment 1, and invite Mr Gray to move or not move. Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 9 in the name of Ian Gray, already debated with Amendment 1, and invite Mr Gray to move or not move. Not moved. Thank you. And I call Amendment 10 in the name of Ian Gray, already debated with Amendment 1, and invite Mr Gray to move or not move. Not moved. Thank you. The question is that for Section 48 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Um, it's just gone ten, approaching ten o'clock. Um, before we move on to the, the new grouping, I uh, suggest we have a suspension for seven minutes or so, uh, and reconvene uh, at about five past ten. Thank you.
Uh, welcome back to the Education and Skills Committee, where we continue with our Stage 2 deliberations on Redress Scotland Bill. Can I move to payments to vulnerable people and call Amendment 28 in the name of Kenneth Gibson, grouped with Amendments 29, 30 and 31. I invite Mr Gibson to move Amendment 28 and speak to all, mem all amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener, and good morning to colleagues and Deputy First Minister. The committee raised concerns about Section 49 in its Stage 1 report, stating that the section is unnecessary due to existing legislation designed to protect vulnerable people and recommending it should therefore be removed from the Bill. The committee's concerns were primarily about the fact that the Adults with Incapacity Scotland Act 2000 already provided sufficient safeguards. While I realise that this provision was well intentioned, I, I agree with the concerns raised in relation to this section. For this reason, I propose that the paragraphs referring to adults with incapacity and those otherwise impaired should be removed from the bill. However, I think it is important to consider the other group of vulnerable applicants included within this section of the bill, children. Children will be able to apply to the scheme as next of kin in certain circumstances, and some may receive a payment of a potentially significant amount as a nominated beneficiary, should a survivor unfortunately pass away prior to their application being fully determined and a payment being made. In these circumstances, we must consider the impact a large lump sum payment may have on a child, particularly children who may also be dealing with additional vulnerabilities, such as having experienced trauma themselves, being at risk of exploitation or dealing with bereavement. For this reason, I, I suggest we take an approach similar to that of the Criminal Injuries Compensation Authority, where Redress Scotland will have the power to make directions in relation to the payment and management of the applicant's award, where the applicant is under 18. As we know, this is the age at which the bill draws a line between children and adults, and this power means that, for example, the payment may be made in instalments or retained until a child turns 18. Within this set of amendments, I have also reflected the Criminal Injuries Compensation Scheme's approach by inserting a subsection which allows a child to request a payment advance. For example, this could be because the applicant lives independently or to assist with their education costs. In any event, once the applicant reaches the age of 18, the amendment guarantees that the whole of the redress payment or the balance will be paid to them in the same way it would be paid to an applicant aged over 18. I feel this set of amendments to Section 49 deals with the Committee's concerns in relation to the treatment of vulnerable adults, whilst ensuring that appropriate safeguards and protections remain in place for children. I therefore move Amendment 28. Thank you very much, Mr Gibson. The question is that Amendment 28 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Call Amendment 29 in the name of Kenneth Gibson, already debated with Amendment 28, and invite Mr Gibson to move or not move. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 29 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Call Amendment 30 in the name of Kenneth Gibson, already debated with Amendment 28, and invite Mr Gibson to move or not move. Moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 30 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 31 in the name of Kenneth Gibson, already debated with Amendment 28. Mr Gibson, to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 31 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 49 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 86 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 57 and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moved, could you? Thank you. The question is that Amendment 86 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 50 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And the question is that Section 51 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 87 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 57, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. In move, Commissioner. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 87 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 52 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 53 to 55 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. 
I call Amendment 88 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 57, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 88 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? <clears throat> we are agreed. The question is that Section 56 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 89 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 57, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 89 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 57 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 58 and 59 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 90 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 57, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moved, Kavir. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 90 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 60 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And the question is that Section 61 and 62 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 113 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 60, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moves, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 113 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 63 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 64 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And I call Amendment 91 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 57, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moves, Kavina. Thank you. Um, the question is that Amendment 91 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 65 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And the question is that Section 66 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 92 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 61, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 92 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 67 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 93 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 57, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moves, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 93 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 68 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 94 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 59, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 94 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. We move to legal fees, and I call Amendment 114 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Group with amendments as shown as the groupings, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 114 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, Kavira. Funding for applicants to obtain independent legal advice is a key element of the redress scheme. It is essential to give survivors a meaningful opportunity to obtain all of the support and advice that they need to allow them to make fully informed decisions when considering an offer of a redress payment. However, as the committee commented in its Stage 1 report, there is a need to manage legal costs. We are learning lessons from other redress schemes in which legal costs have escalated and been subject to criticism. We do not want that for this scheme. We want the majority of money to go to survivors. We therefore need to respect the importance of independent legal advice for survivors, whilst providing clarity to those providing that advice as to the arrangements which will apply. The evidence heard by the committee there was criticism of what was felt by some to be the complex nature of the legal fee provisions in the bill. There was concern that the approach introduced an unnecessary bureaucratic burden on both solicitors applying for legal fees 
and redress Scotland in assessing them. A desire was also expressed for greater certainty as to what payment the solicitors would receive for their work. After reflecting on that evidence, I have brought forward these Stage 2 amendments to introduce fixed fees for legal advice. These provisions are more straightforward and they will give further surety over legal spend. Furthermore, the new approach will mean simplified processes where, rather than all fee requests being passed to redress Scotland for assessment, only those which require an element of judgment and decision making will be forwarded on. This will further cut down on administration costs and allow Redress Scotland to apply their expertise and focus on the assessment of redress applications rather than the assessment of legal fees in every case. At the same time, the provisions retain an element of flexibility. While the amendments provide for fixed fees, there is still the ability for the solicitor to apply for a bespoke arrangement assessment to be carried out in cases where there are exceptional or unexpected circumstances which the solicitor believes may justify the payment of an additional sum. The bill, as introduced, provided that legal advice paid for under the scheme would not include advice on whether to pursue litigation as an alternative to making a redress application. We had criticism of that approach. My amendments today recognise that giving notice on civil litigation as an alternative to the redress scheme can legitimately be funded by the scheme to the extent that the advice is part of other work on making an application. Whether it is essentially advice about deciding whether to sign the waiver or not, that is covered. It will though, still be the case that the amount at which the fixed fee is set will not be based on the expectation that extensive advice on civil litigation will form part of this process. That type of advice can often involve significant investigation by the solicitor, expert reports and opinions from various professionals, such as those from counsel or medical experts. Whilst complex and thorough legal analysis can be necessary in civil litigation, the redress scheme is deliberately designed to remove some of those complexities. There are already existing funding routes in place to assist those wishing to pursue a civil case, such as legal aid and no-win, no-fee arrangements. I would encourage survivors who have an interest in exploring potential litigation to seek legal advice on this and use the existing funding options available for that. If they are unable to do this prior to submitting their redress application or decide they want to explore this after they have submitted their redress application, the redress scheme allows a survivor to pause their redress application. My officials will continue to work with the Law Society of Scotland and other stakeholders, as well as learning from other redress schemes to ensure that the fees paid by the scheme are reasonable and that applicants can access quality legal advice without unnecessary or excessive costs being incurred by the scheme. I am grateful to Mr Gibson for bringing forward his amendment, which will pre prevent solicitors from being able to top up the fee they receive from the redress scheme and recoup further fees from applicants. I fully support Mr Gibson's amendment, which will provide survivors with reassurance that they will not have to top up, top up the scheme's legal fees from their own funds or their redress payment. I move Amendment 114, Convener. Thank you. Um, can I invite Mr Gibson to speak to Amendment 124 and the other amendments in the group? Thank you, Convener. Um, survivors should have security that they will not face legal fees in addition to those paid for by ministers under the redress scheme. And I want to make sure that solicitors who obtain fees under this scheme cannot also bill their clients for the same work. They cannot do that under legal aid, so shouldn't be able to do that here either. Uh, this amendment will offer protection to survivors by helping to assure them that the scheme is designed to pay all reasonable legal costs in connection with redress applications. Survivors should fully expect to keep the entirety of the redress payment without further legal fees being deducted, and this amendment will ensure that this is the case. This bill cannot be a dripping roast for lawyers, as appears to have been the case in Ireland, and I therefore warmly welcome the Deputy First Minister's amendments in this regard. Uh, my own amendment also recognises that survivors may receive some advice on civil litigation prospects as part of the advice and assistance that they receive in connection with the application process, in particular signing the waiver and choosing to accept an offer of redress rather than going to court. That is paid for under the redress scheme. However, if a survivor decides to pursue the court route instead and commissions extensive legal advice on that, the solicitor should not be prevented from billing them for that or receiving legal aid for that work. I urge committee members to support this amendment, which I suggest adds clarity to the provisions on legal fees and provides reassurance to survivors 
and indeed those advising them. Thank you, Mr. Gibson. Can I invite Mr. Uh, Green to take part in the debate? <coughs> Just waiting on my audio. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary and uh, Kenny Gibson for these really important amendments? I think this is an area of concern I flagged in, in the early days of proceedings. Um, uh, I, I, I guess what I'm, I'm trying to elicit or I'm unsure about is, is the, the net effect of all of these amendments. Uh, will that result in, in the scenario whereby, if a payment, if an award is given uh, to an individual, that individual will retain 100%? of the award come what may. And the reason I ask that is that is there any technical opportunity for a solicitor who is appointed by an individual to act on their behalf, able to, uh, under the legislation as, as drafted and even with these amendments, still be able to deduct uh, any portion of that award uh, from the money that's paid uh, whether that's fees or any other uh, means as suggested. I guess what I'm getting at is this. Are we 100 per cent sure that the, the effect of these amendments mean that the uh, applicants, even if they've had third party help from an organisation, including a solicitor, will keep 100 per cent of the money awarded and that money will be either paid directly to them or if paid to a third party, they will receive 100 per cent of the award that was given to them by the panel? Thank you, Mr. Green. I'm going to bring in Mr. Johnson. Thank you very much, convener. Um, can I begin by reminding uh, the committee that my wife is a practicing, a practicing solicitor? Um, uh, and can I also, uh, at the outset, state that I, I wholeheartedly agree uh, with uh, the, 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 the sentiments and intent behind both the government amendments and, and those of uh, Kenneth Gibson? And in particular, I think he is quite correct. Um, that we must ensure that, that any legal uh, compensation uh, is not used uh, by solicitors uh, to uh, essentially um, unduly uh, gain compensation through this scheme. And I think we must learn the lessons of uh, other uh, examples of this in other jurisdictions. However, I, I was just wondering if we could provide, if, if some clarity could be provided. I'm concerned that. The, 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 there may be unintended consequences of these amendments, um, such uh, as situations whereby an application is made and then subsequent to, to that, uh, uh, an individual seeks uh, uh, clarity. It, it's not beyond uh, possibility that mistakes may be made, um, that, that, that clarifications may be sought, and indeed uh, the, the decisions and awards made by uh, Redress Scotland challenged uh, legally, what I would not want to happen is that because of this, I mean, a very understandable and, and indeed I think quite important amendment that people are, are barred from getting legal advice uh, when they are quite legitimately seeking to, to clarify and indeed potentially challenge uh, the decisions, which is ultimately a very important uh, principle in uh, a democratic society and indeed I believe a, a kind of requirement under human rights. I would just like to seek that clarification that it does not restrict people's ability to gain legal advice uh, in, in the future and indeed seek legal redress. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Again, I'm uh, conscious that um, this platform makes debate quite difficult. There were some direct questions from both Mr. Johnson and Mr. Green, so I wonder if Mr. Gibson would like the opportunity to address those before I bring in the Cabinet Secretary to wind up. Yes, yeah, sure. Well, um, solicitors will not be able to top up the fee they receive from the redress scheme and recoup fees over and above that which is paid by scheme in relation to an application. So, I think crucially from the, the issue that, that, that was raised there by Ms. Uh, 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 that um, it's not going to, this is not going to impact upon the final sum that is received by the uh, applicant, and but it doesn't actually restrict applicants from pursuing um, um, additional kind of uh, legal advice, which would hopefully be paid through uh, legal aid. So, for example, a survivor can pursue the court route and commission uh, legal advice from a solicitor, and the solicitor will not be prevented them 
um, from billing them, but that would be paid for by Legal Aid Work. So there should be no impact on the redress payment, which I believe uh, both um, Jamie and Daniel are most concerned about. Thank you, Mr. Gibson. Uh, <coughs> Cabinet Secretary, would you like to up? Thank you very much, Convener, and I'm grateful to colleagues for their comments on this uh, section. In relation to the point raised by Mr. Green, um, it, within the redress scheme, there is no opportunity for a, 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 a solicitor to be able to secure payment beyond the legal fees that are envisaged from the sum awarded to a survivor. A survivor might make a private arrangement or conceivably could make a private arrangement with a solicitor, but that would be out with the scheme, but certainly within the scheme provision, um, the point that Mr Green um, raises is, um, is assured. Um, but since he has raised that point, I will undertake further scrutiny of that issue um, before um, we get to stage three. And I think Mr. Green may be wishing to make an intervention on the convener, which I'd be happy to accept. Thank you, Mr. Green. Thank you. The powers of the chat box. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I think I, I think therein is where I'm probing this: is is that if we yeah. could look at this ahead, because if there's any loophole there which is perhaps benign uh, in the system, uh, it, it's very you know the, the source of people who may be applying for. Uh, for assistance are, are perhaps those most likely to be uh, vulnerable, and uh, I, I, I think the cabinet section knows, knows where I'm going with this. So, um, private arrangements may very well be be legal and, and bona fide, um, but that doesn't necessarily always make them morally right. So, I wonder if, if the cabinet section would work, work work with members on that as we move forward. I I I, I take that I take that point on board, and I think. You know, although I uh, am giving a, a, what I hope is a reassuring response to Mr. Green, I want to take this issue away once we settled stage two and consider whether there are, in the cold light of day, any other loopholes of the type that he raises that um, uh, that might still be there, and we will take steps if necessary to address them, and we'll uh, I'll happily discuss those with Mr. Green and colleagues. Um, in advance of stage three. In relation to Mr Johnson's points, um, there is the flexibility for solicitors to seek sanction to increase the, in the, the, the fixed fee, um, so cases and survivors would not be prejudiced um, in that process. But um, uh, so, so, you know, I, I do think there is a, a rigidity and a shape in place that enables survivors to access independent legal advice in connection with the scheme, um, and that. To, uh, for those providing that advice, they know the arrangements for fees that will apply. So it's providing certainty to everybody involved, survivors and providers of legal advice. Um, and obviously, we acknowledge within this bill the importance of individuals having access to independent legal advice to enable them to take appropriate decision making in relation to their circumstances. And I would conclude my remarks there, Convener, by inviting um, colleagues to support the amendments in this group. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. So the question is that Amendment 114 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Call Amendment 11 in the name of Ian Gray, already debated with Amendment 1. No. Ian Gray to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. Um, the question is that Section 69 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 115 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary? Already debated with Amendment 60, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 115 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 95 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 61, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 95 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And the question is that Section 70 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Uh, we move to Section on Air. 
Nicole, Amendment 116 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendments 118, 127, 128 and 134. And I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 116 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. This group of amendments is concerned with the approach set out in the Bill to payments made as a result of an error. By that, I mean both where an administrative error has occurred in making the payment, such as payment of an incorrect amount or payment to the wrong person. And secondly, where there has been an error which led to the decision to make the payment being made incorrectly or being made correctly, but having been based on incorrect or misleading information, which materially affected the decision to make the payment. For example, this could cover fraudulent information. The bill, as introduced, contained provisions to allow for the recovery of redress payments in these circumstances. This is an appropriate financial control. It also ensures that the scheme has the powers it needs to deter fraud or to effectively deal with the consequences of fraud should it arise. Amendment 127 is the main amendment in this group, and it ensures that errors can be addressed properly in all aspects of the redress scheme by allowing for the recovery of other payments made in connection with applications for redress payments. As I mentioned, recovery of redress payments themselves is already covered by sections 71 to 75 of the Bill. The payments covered by Amendment 127 are all other payments under the Bill. These are payments to people providing support to survivors before they apply as well as after, payments of professional reports, fees for legal work, and other costs and expenses that an applicant for a redress payment might have incurred. A person who has been paid for any of this work, either directly or indirectly, may have to pay that money back if there has been an error in relation to the making of the payment. The error must relate to the payment made and not, for instance, to any redress payment with which it is connected. For example, if a redress payment was initially made due to fraud, these provisions would not allow for the recovery of the legal fees in connection with that application where the solicitor was unaware of their client's behaviour. I want to be clear, however, that this amendment would not allow for the recovery of a payment made in error from a survivor. Instead, the amendment allows for the recovery of payments made due to error to be recovered from those benefiting from the error, to the professional who was, for example, overpaid for support services or legal work or the expert who fraudulently invoiced for assessments not actually carried out or reports not submitted. Amendment 128 would insert a regulation-making power into the bill so that further detail about how recovery of payments made due to an error can be set out. This is similar to Section 75 of the bill, which makes that sort of provision in relation to the recovery of redress payments. Amendment 134 is consequential on Amendment 128. Finally, Amendments 116 and 118 make minor technical changes to the sections on the recovery of redress payments that have been made as a result of error. I would hope that the committee members agree with me that it is essential that the scheme has the power to, it needs to ensure that any error in payment can effectively be dealt with by the scheme separately and in addition to any criminal or professional sanctions. Accordingly, I move Amendment 116. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I do not see any indications from members that they wish to take part in the debate. So, uh, Do you wish to say anything further, Cabinet Secretary? Thank you. The question is that Amendment 116 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 71 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 96 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 57, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Uh, move, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 96 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The call Amendment 97 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 64, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Uh, move, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 97 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 72 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 98 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 57, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 98 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 73 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? 
We are agreed. The question is that section 74 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 117 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 114, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moved, Green. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 117 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 118 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 116, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move. It moved, Green. Thank you. Um, the question is that Amendment 118 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 12 in the name of Ian Gray. Already debated with Amendment 1 and invite Mr Gray to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you, Mr Gray. The question is that Section 75 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And the question is that section 76 to 78 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I move to information accessed by applicant and call Amendment 32 in the name of Daniel Johnson, grouped with Amendment 33. I invite Mr Johnson to move Amendment 32 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you very much, Kamina. This uh, relates to an issue that I raised at the additional evidence session that we took uh, last uh, month. It, it, it's the very sad situation that many survivors simply do not know precisely what happened to them, uh, the, the nature of the, the, the uh, experiences that they had. They did not know uh, necessarily where they were or who placed them there, uh, the reasons, the rationales. Uh, or uh, 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 other such uh, circumstances relating to their time in care. This, this, um, this amendment, uh, number 32 and 33, simply seeks to establish their right to gain uh, the information that, that may be uh, 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 in the possession of Redress Scotland. It, it is very likely, uh, certainly, it's certainly possible that Redress Scotland, through the course of their activities, uh, gain access to evidence that the uh, survivors themselves have not previously uh, had access to. So what this uh, seeks to do is establish the fact that they would have the, the right to have access to that information uh, at, uh, you know, through uh, the course of their uh, application. Uh, clearly, uh, this cannot uh, contravene uh, any pre-existing leg legislation regarding uh, data protection, uh, and that is uh, sought to clarify. But I think this is a straightforward amendment, and, but actually a very important one. And I know it's certainly important to a number of survivors who are keen to establish this right. Thank you, Mr Johnson. Um, I don't see indications from any other members wishing to take part in the debate. So, right, uh, the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Kavira. Um, I thank uh, Mr Johnson for bringing these amendments. I am in agreement that we should do all we can to maximise survivors' access to their records and to ensure that applicants are aware, as far as is possible within the existing legislation, of the form and contents of any evidence relating to their application that is submitted by others to redress Scotland. These amendments represent a positive addition to the scheme. I would, however, mention at this stage that there are some points of detail which require to be looked at further and which I consider will need adjustment at stage three. On that basis, I am pleased to support them today and to work with Mr Johnson to make the necessary technical proposals for Parliament to consider at stage three. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Mr Johnson, do you wish to wind up? I will just very briefly I thank the Cabinet Secretary for those remarks, and, and certainly I am very keen to work with him to uh, make any corrections or adjustments to these amendments at stage three. Uh, can I invite you to press your amendment, please? I will press uh, Amendment uh, 32 and Amendment 33. Thank you very much. Uh, the question is that Amendment 32 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 79 to 82 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 33 in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated. I think you have moved that already. Can you do it again, Mr Johnson? Moved. Thank you. Um, the question is that Amendment 33 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And The question is that Section 83 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? 
We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 13 in the name of Ian Gray, already debated with Amendment 1, and invite Mr Gray to move or not move? So moved. Thank you. Invite call Amendment 14 in the name of Ian Gray, already debated with Amendment 1, and invite Mr Gray to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 15 in the name of Ian Gray, already debated with Amendment 1, and invite Mr Gray to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. The question is that section 84 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Call Amendment 119 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 60, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Uh, move, Kabir. Uh, the question is that Amendment 119 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Thank you. The question is that section 85 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 99 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 61. I invite the uh, Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moved, Kavir. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 99 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And I call Amendment 16 in the name of Ian Gray, already debated with Amendment 1. I invite Mr Gray to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. The question is that section 86 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that section 87 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 120 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 114. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved, Kabir. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 120 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 88 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Can I call Amendments 121, 122 and 123, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, and all previously debated, invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendments 121 and 123 on block? It moved on block, Kavir. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put in Amendments 121 to 123? The question is that Amendments 121 to 123 are agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Call Amendment 124 in the name of Kevin, Kenneth Gibson, already debated with Amendment 114, and invite Mr Gibson to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 124 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Thank you. The call Amendment 1, call Amendment 17 in the name of Ian Gray, already debated with Amendment 1. I invite Mr Gray to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. I call Amendment 125 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 114. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moved, Kavina. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 125 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. So I call Amendment 126 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 114, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Um, move, Kavina. Right. Okay. Can I pause there? Um, just to check with the clerks that I haven't missed a section. I think they might have indicated not everything's fine. Sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, so can I call Amendment 126 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 144, invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally? Move, Kavina. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 126 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Call Amendment 127 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 16. Invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moved, Kavira. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 127 be, be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 128 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 116? Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moved, Kavira. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 128 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Thank you. Um, move to advance payment scheme. 
report and call amendment 18 in the name of Ian Gray, group with amendment 19, and I invite Mr Gray to move amendment 18 and speak to both amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, I move amendment 18 uh, and speak to all the amendments in this group. And these amendments are designed to try and reflect evidence which the committee heard. It actually isn't about the redress scheme, but rather about the advanced payment scheme. Uh, and the point was made quite strongly to us that in the circumstances of the pandemic, that there was a case, and I think a case was made, uh, for reducing the uh, qualifying age uh, for applying to the advanced payment scheme. It is currently 70, and the suggestion was it be reduced to normal retirement age, which would be 66. Um, now, I should say that the evidence that the committee heard uh, of the advanced payment scheme was almost entirely very positive, um, and in particular around the way in which uh, the scheme had dealt with the, um, the evidence and testimonies of survivors. Um, so this is not in any way a, a really a criticism, criticism of the advanced payment scheme, simply to say that we are in a very particular circumstance, and this would be a way of recognising it in line with the fundamental purpose of, of the scheme uh, to allow redress for those who may not have a great deal of time uh, to wait for that. However, it is of course the case that the advanced payment scheme uh, was set up by separate legislation, so it is quite difficult, I think, uh, to amend the advanced payment scheme within uh, the bill that we are considering today. Uh, and I also recognise the fact that the redress scheme we are legislating for just now is to replace the advance payment scheme. So uh, we are uh, really talking about the potential for a change for the window between now and hopefully uh, very soon when the re new redress scheme comes into play. So these amendments are designed to try and uh, allow for some consideration uh, of the circumstance. And what I suggest is that um, uh, immediately on the legislation. Uh, receiving royal assent, um, ministers must lay before the parliament a report which says um, uh, sets out the timetable for the introduction of the new scheme uh, and gives them the opportunity to say whether they believe any changes should be made in that admittedly brief period to the advanced payment scheme, and in particular uh, whether uh, any changes should be made in response to, to the pandemic. Thank you, Mr. Gray. I don't see any other members indicating they wish to take part in the debate, so we invite the Cabinet Secretary. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, I am grateful to Mr. Gray for the amendments that he has proposed, and I understand the need for clarity and transparency in, in, in relation to when survivors can expect Redress Scotland to be established, and more importantly, when they can make an application to the scheme and receive their redress. I am determined to deliver redress to survivors as soon as possible following parliamentary consideration of the Bill. I am grateful to members from all parties who have made clear their commitment to redress. Survivors have waited long enough, and we have all put that point on the record. It would, however, be unusual to enshrine within parliamentary legislation such a short-term commitment as this amendment proposes. That said, I do understand the importance of survivors and others to have an early update on implementation. Um, as we know, there is an election scheduled, and uh, obviously we do not yet know the outcome of that election. But should the government be re-elected, I am happy to commit to updating Parliament before the summer recess on the matters set out in the amendment, and happy to do that by laying a report, if that is the preference. Indeed, I fully expect to provide more of an update on implementation of the uh, scheme to Parliament at Stage 3. Um, I would ask uh, Mr Gray to accept my commitment given today and ask him not to, protect, pre to press this particular amendment. In relation to the advance payment scheme, it is important to bear in mind that it was set up on grounds of urgency using exceptional common law powers. And if I can just clarify that the uh, current age for the advance payments scheme, uh, the, the minimum age is 68, and we reduced that from 70 in the original scheme. Any changes to the scheme will have to be consistent with the legal powers underpinning the scheme. The advanced payment scheme was always intended to be a precursor to the main statutory scheme. 
Our priority now is to ensure that the development and implementation of the statutory redress scheme continues at pace and that Redress Scotland is established and begins to assess redress applications from survivors as quickly as possible. We regularly monitor the effectiveness of the advanced payment scheme and where minor changes to improve the scheme can be made in a way which also respects the legal basis upon uh, and purpose for which it was set up, we welcome the opportunity to consider these options. I will further consider what options are available to me, whilst of course mindful of the limited nature of the powers under which the advanced payment scheme operates, and if the Government is re elected, I commit to updating Parliament on this before the summer recess. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. Um, I do not see any indication of other members. So um can I invite Mr Gray to wind up and to press or withdraw his amendment. So on the basis of the commitments that um the Cabinet Secretary has given and uh, uh, and the certainty that he will remember when we get to stage three to make those commitments again uh, on the record, um I appreciate his response and on that basis I will not uh, press these amendments. Thank you, Mr Gray. Um Move to the question that section 91 to 93 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. Sorry, if I can say to broadcasting, I can't have a I don't have a gallery view yet to do now. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Thank you. Um, can we move to survivors forum and call amendment one two nine in the name of Daniel Johnson, group with amendment one three five, Daniel Johnson to move amendment one two nine and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you, convener. Um, I think one of the uh, issues that the committee grappled with while it was scrutinising this bill was what the appropriate involvement of survivors was within Redress Scotland. And that's not uh, just difficult for us. I, mean, I think there's a, a range of views among survivors themselves as to what's uh, appropriate. Um, and there were some views uh, stating that, that, that uh, survivors should be not just uh, in, involved with the scheme overall, but actually involved uh, uh, in, in, in uh, the panels and others that thought that was entirely uh, 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 inappropriate. But what I think is important is that they, there is a, a role for survivors in the operation of the scheme overall. I think it's also important that that is uh, uh, put on, on, on the face of the bill. And this amendment uh, uh, flows directly from representations made to me by uh, survivors. So what this uh, uh, seeks to do is uh, establish uh, the survivors forum uh, on, on the face of the bill and also uh, set out uh, the broad functions of, of uh, that uh, body that it should be there to seek to improve uh, the scheme, to provide uh, scrutiny and assessment uh, of how it is operating, uh, and ensuring uh, that the, the overall operation of the, the scheme is done in a trauma-informed way uh, and sensitive to the needs uh, and requirements uh, of uh, survivors. Uh, so, in, in, in short, uh, that's what it, it, it seeks uh, to do, um, and I think it provides clarity for, for survivors regarding what, what role they will have in the functioning of uh, Redress Scotland. Thank you, Mr Johnson. I do not see any indication for other members wishing to take part in the debate, so I will move to the uh, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Kavira. Uh, I am grateful to Mr Johnson for bringing forward these amendments, which will put the Survivors Forum on the face of the bill, and I am happy to support them in principle. Um, as you know, Kavira, we are already fully committed to establishing the forum. I share Mr Johnson's intention that survivors should play a key role in improving and enhancing the delivery of the scheme throughout its lifetime. It will be invaluable to have the forum's feedback and perspectives on the survivor experience of the scheme. We need to know whether applicants feel they are indeed being treated with dignity, respect and compassion, and whether more can be done to support them and make the application process as straightforward as possible. I believe it is these principles which Mr Johnson has sought to reflect through these amendments. I share these objectives, and I hope he will agree that we might work together to introduce technical improvements at Stage 3 in relation to the specific wording of the provision. For example, we might want to make this slightly more flexible, so that there is the possibility of family members of survivors, such as next of kin, being forum members too. It may also be helpful to provide... Sorry, Cabinet Secretary. I think Mr. Greer would like to intervene. Could you just confirm that? If yes, sorry, I should have put I rather than R in the chat box. Apologies, Convener. 
Yeah, I'm happy to give you a few. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, on the the point you raise around uh, potential further changes at, at stage three to improve on this, I've been contacted by a number of survivors who, whilst understanding the, the principle behind the forum, have a, a significant amount of concern that committee members are, and yourself will be aware of around um, perceived hierarchies within the survivor community, some voices being heard more than others. Um, so I would simply uh, urge that in the process of developing potential amendments for stage three and then in the further process of setting up the forum, that consultation with survivors is extensive to make sure that those who are sceptical and, and concerned about this uh, have their voice heard, as, as well as those who are already confident that the, the forum is required. Yeah, Cabinet Secretary? I am happy to give that assurance that there must be consultation underpinned with survivors to, in all of these issues. It, that principle has run through all of the steps the government has taken to design this scheme, and I want that to be a characteristic which is um, that runs through all of our remaining actions. It is vital that we build confidence around these arrangements within the survivor community. That has not always been present. And it is uh, an objective to which I am wholly committed. So I am very happy to give that assurance to, to Mr. Greer and to survivors. Um, in, in relation to possible changes and at stage three, it may be also helpful to provide flexibility so that others who are not survivors themselves could nonetheless contribute to the forum, um, uh, potentially as chair to support the survivors or as representative from a supportive organisation. But my, my Commitment to Mr. Greer is that we have to trade with care uh, and with openness to make sure we get that detail correct. We may also want to look at whether regulations under this new provision would always require to be subject to the affirmative procedure, or whether there should be some degree of flexibility in relation to the exercise of those powers. For example, if they were simply amending provisions on levels of members' expenses in light of inflation. We would also want to consider carefully the proposed functions of the forum. For example, the bill talks about a process of offers rather than awards. We also need to be careful what is said about scrutiny, given the confidential and independent nature of the decision-making process, so the idea of providing feedback may be more appropriate. So, while I see some points of detail which I think will need further refinement, I do support these amendments today and would propose to work together with Mr Johnson with a view to bringing forward further amendments at Stage 3 on those points of detail. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Can I invite Mr Johnson to wind up and to press or withdraw his amendment? Thank you very much, Convener, and can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for those constructive remarks. And I am very happy to uh, work uh, with him and indeed others uh, to modify uh, th th this uh, amendment at stage three. Um, and I certainly have no objections to, to the. Uh, details that the Cabinet Secretary uh, 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 brought up uh, in his remarks. I would also just like to thank Ross Greer for his remarks. I think he is absolutely right. Uh, while I think this uh, forum is absolutely vital uh, for Redress Scotland, there are clearly uh, sensitivities regarding its composition and its functioning. And I certainly understand and recognise the concerns that he uh, voiced. Uh, but with that, I will conclude, uh, convener, uh, and I am happy to move uh, uh, Amendment 129 in my name. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. The question is that Amendment 129 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I can't see a gallery. I can't see a gallery view now. Are we all agreed? It, we. We are agreed. Thank you. The question is that section 94 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that schedule 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call amendment 130 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with amendment 60, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move. And move, Kavita. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 130 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 131 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 114, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moved, convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 131 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? 
and we are agreed. The question is that section 95 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 101 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 60. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moved, Kabir. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 101 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The amendment. I call Amendment 132 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 114. I invite Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moved, Kabir. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 132 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Again, I can't can't see a gallery view. That is very helpful. Thank you. Um, yes, we are agreed. I call Amendment 102 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 1, Amendment 55, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move for, formally. It moved, Kavina. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 102 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 103 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 55. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Move, Kavina. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 103 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 96 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Uh, I call Amendment 104 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 25, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Move, Kavina. Thank you. I call Amendment 104A in the name of Alec Neil, already debated with Amendment 25, and invite Mr Neil to move or not move. Move. Thank you, um, Mr. Neil. The question is that Amendment 104A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And I invite the Cabinet Secretary to press or withdraw Amendment 104 as amended. It moved, Kavina. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 104 as amended to be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Thank you. I call it Amendment 133 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 144. Sorry, beg your pardon. Already debated with Amendment 114. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moved, Kabir. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 133 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 97 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 105 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary? Already debated with Amendment 37 and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moved, Kabir. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 105 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 106 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary? Already debated with Amendment 1 and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moved, Kavir. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 106 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 134 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 116, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move? It moved, Kavir. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 134 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Thank you. I call Amendment 135 in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with Amendment 129. Mr Johnson, to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 135 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Thank you. The amendment, I call Amendment 107 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 1, and ask the Cabinet Secretary to move. It moved, Kavina. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 107 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 136, 137, 138, and 139, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendments 136 to 139 on block. Moved on block, Kavina. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question we put on Amendments 136 to 139? 
Uh, so the question is that amendments 136 to 139 are agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Thank you. The question is that section 98 to be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that section 99 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call amendment 19 in the name of Ian Gray. Already debated with Amendment 18 and invite Mr. Gray to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. The question is that Section 100 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 101 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And that ends stage two consideration of the bill. The bill will be reprinted as amended as stage two and will be published tomorrow morning. The Parliament has not yet determined when stage three will be held. Members will be informed of that in due course, along with the deadline for launching stage three amendments. In the meantime, stage three amendments can be lodged with the clerks in the legislation team. And just before I close committee, can I thank everyone for their um, uh, input today and previously on our stage two deliberations. I'd like to thank the clerking team and the bill team for their support during this process as well. And again, uh, thank Professor Kendrick for his advice to, to the committee um, at stage one and stage two of our deliberations. And a final thank you once again to all victim survivors who engaged with the bill process uh, we, we certainly could not have achieved what we have today without out their input and their willingness to come forward. And on that note, I will close committee today. Thank you. <laughs>